All right, wonderful. Howdy, howdy, grab your Bibles. Uh, hopefully you brought them. Hopefully you brought them. Grab your Bibles. We're going to do a sword drill, give away a couple thousand points. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5. This is something, a verse that you all know, of course. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5, and go. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5. Go for it. Read it for me. <laughs> All right, perfect. Here's how much it is. Here's how much it is. Hold on. Hold on. We're gonna pray, but I don't want I don't want to pray for you. I know that might seem selfish. Okay. I'm gonna pray for us. I want you to pray for you. Okay. Last night when we came, we talked about you getting something because you wanted it. So what I want you to do is decide right now if you want something or not. And if you want something, ask for it. If you want God for wisdom, if you want God to just give you something from the lesson, if you want God to help you pay attention, whatever it is that you want, ask God for it, okay? That's part of part of having a walk with God, is you going to God and specifically asking Him for something and expecting that He'll give it to you. So let's pray together, and you pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for these kids and how much they love you. Lord, I thank you so much that... Uh, they're attentive and they're listening. I pray that you would give them something, a truth that they can hang on to. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us to be able to be bold and do things for the first time we haven't done before. And uh, just give us insight into the practical side of life and uh, our, our everyday life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a big stage. And I remember it very, very clearly because it was the first time as a six or seven year old that I was going to perform my violin in front of thousands of people. And we went to UAF and there was a big week that week and everyone had a violin and there were classes all day long, every day. And uh, at the end of the week, there were students that were chosen, that well, victims that were chosen, that would have to perform for all of the other people. And of course, I saw other kids getting up there and performing and I knew that my day was coming, although I didn't know when. They don't tell you too much ahead of time because they want the anticipation uh, to kill you. And so when they finally told me that I was going to be performing the next day, I got ready and of course I was practicing and practicing and practicing. And uh, my dad told me something that I absolutely never forgot. I went out on the, on the, the uh, stage that day and I was going to perform. And if he didn't tell me this, I am almost positive that I would have catastrophically messed up. But because he told me one sentence worth of knowledge, I succeeded at playing my violin and performing the song that I had practiced for up to three months before that. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute. When I went over to Africa with Mr. Fulford, one of the, one of the things that I did when I was in Africa was talk to somebody uh, about soul winning. And that's something that they do a lot there and they actually get together on Saturday morning and they go soul winning at the church. As I'm talking to you about things that I do for the first time and that I've done, I want to relate that to your side. Because too often, I think that I, as a preacher, get up here and, and would give you a bunch of Bible knowledge or facts or points, but I don't apply it to your life. What I want you to do is see how I've done things for the first time and know that you can do things for the first time. Okay, That's my goal, is to get you guys to the place where when something new comes up, you go, oh, I have no idea how to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because that's, that is doing something for the first time. So, in Africa, it being 90 degrees with humidity and billions of bugs and insects and ants and all kinds of other stuff, I went over to the guy there, his name was Shadrick, and I said, uh, Shadrick, or, or we're going to go soul winning this morning. So we all got ready, and we all got in a vehicle and drove out to where we were going. And as we got out, I am the American. I am the guy that they look at as the guy that knows everything even though I don't. That's a bad place to be. It's kind of like they put you way up there and you're looking down like, that's a long ways to fall, you know? But so the point is, we get out there soul winning, and he does the soul winning the first time, and I'm praying for the people, and of course there's two or three people that we're talking to at a time, and uh, then he talks to them, and I'm listening to him. Of course, I don't understand anything they're saying, because it's on to Chewa. But then when he gets to the end of that, he goes to the next house. And now, I don't know if he did this intentionally or not, but right before we got to the house, right before he says hi, he said, okay, it's your turn, my brother. And I was like, say what? Like, I don't know the culture. I don't know the people. I don't know how to talk to these people. And, and, and so how in the world am I supposed to talk to them about Jesus Christ through an interpreter? And so 
I, of course, turned around and ran back to Mr. Fulford and told him that I was not going soul winning again, because that's what I did. No. <laughs> but what would you have done? And think about this. You guys are in situations all the time where you have opportunities to talk to people about Jesus Christ. The thought comes into your mind, and too often we go like this, and we push it right back out. We're like, huh, there's stuff that's easier that, that I can talk about, stuff that isn't quite as uncomfortable. You know why it's uncomfortable? Because you think it is. Yeah. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I opened my mouth and I started talking to these people. And I, I thought that I was going to be, and maybe some of you know, the Ray Comfort of Africa. The guy that has all of those perfect, beautiful picture illustrations. And that I would just very clearly speak to these people and they would fall down and accept Christ as their Savior. And uh, so I started with the courtroom because I had heard Ray Comfort use the courtroom. And I said, okay, so do you know you're a sinner? And we talked about that. I said, now, if you're in court... And, the, and you, you killed somebody. Their eyes got really big, and that translated into their language. And, uh, and they start looking, because there was a family of them, they start looking at each other, like, hey, you killed somebody? Like, where is this in the gospel, you know? And so then I go on, I say, you killed somebody, and uh, you deserve to go to, to go to prison. And I come in, and I pay your fine. And so this is all being interpreted for him. Okay? So I go through the illustration. I pay your fine. Then the judge can let you go. And at the end... The people looked just as confused as when I started. And so I looked at Shadrach. Shadrach looked at me like, what are you going to say next? you got to clean this up. And I'm like, oh boy. So needless to say, when you do something for the first time, don't expect it to be perfect. Okay? You cannot, com well, okay, you can, but you shouldn't compare yourself with a seasoned veteran. Okay? These guys grew up in Africa. They know the culture, they know the people, they know the language, they know the pictures that they can use to connect the dots for the people. I don't know any of that. So there is no way that I can go over there and expect to be the same level that they are. Does that make sense? So when you do something, don't compare yourself with other people. If I was taking notes, that's the first thing I'd write down. Don't compare yourself to other people. A martial arts person said one time, you don't compare yourself to the instructor. You compare yourself to the beginner. Because when you compare yourself to the instructor, you really never match up. And this is, of course, secular. But you compare yourself to the instructor, you never quite get as good as he is. But then after four or five years, the guy said that the new people come in, and you look at them and go, wow, they have no idea what they're doing. And I can see that. Which means you've progressed a little bit. So what I want you to do, what I want you to do is think with me, and we're going to go back to a violin stage, and I'm going to tell you what my dad said. He said, Stephen, now I was nervous, as all get out, and so he walked up with me to this back little room that they have off to the side there, and you'd have the stage out here, and then it's just all dark out there, and you can only see about the first six or eight rows. He got really close to me, and he said, Stephen, when you play your violin, just perform for your mom and I. When you look out at the audience, you don't look at everybody. You just see your mom, and you see me. Don't worship anybody. You can look at your violin, make sure your fingering is correct, make sure your bow is in the right place. He says, but when you look at the crowd, look at me. Don't look at, don't look at everybody else. And so, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, I walk out there, and all of a sudden, there's deafening applause to a seven-year-old, because there's darkness of people out there, who knows how many people, and so, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, I'm walking out there, and you get to the piano, and you stop at the piano, and you turn this direction, you have your violin like you're supposed to under your arm, because you're not very good at it yet, and so, you take, your, you take your violin, and you bow like you do, and when you come up, my parents were right in front of me, and I saw my parents, and I put my violin up, and I stepped like I was supposed to, and I pulled the first note out of the violin, and it went fine. Until about halfway through the song. And halfway through the song, I got comfortable. I got comfortable out here. I'm doing really well on this song. The piano is, is accompanying me very nicely. I'm looking at my parents, and they're both smiling away. And so, catch this, I took my eyes off my parents. And I started looking and how many people were watching me. <laughs> and all the looks they had on their faces. 
And then I saw these big monsters back then that had bubbles on the front and they would video you with them because we weren't advanced back then. And so I'm like, whoa, this is being recorded. And you know what happened? My mind wasn't focused on what I was doing. It was focused on what they thought of me. And when I was focused on what they thought of me, my fingers started hitting the wrong notes, my hands started sweating, my bow started going everywhere, and you know how I recovered? Dad was going like this. Not really big, he was going like this. And as I was looking everywhere and fumbling all around, I saw my dad, and he just went like this. And I looked at my dad, and I got back on, and I finished the song. What I wanna do, when you do something for the first time, you gotta have your eyes on God. You got to have your eyes on God. There was an illustration. I'm going to tell you a story that happened actually earlier this year, and uh, well, no, last year. And so what what happened was, I'm coming back from men's retreat, and as I come back for, before I go to men's retreat, Pastor gives me a call, and I'm working at the church at this time, and he says, Stephen, there is a guy named Mr. Donahue, and he says there's a job that you could work just three days, and it pays sixty dollars an hour. And I was like, oh, wow. And he's like, yeah, I didn't know if you'd be interested, but I thought I'd tell you, here's his phone number. So I call Mr. Donahue, and I say, uh, I didn't get him, so I left a message, and he says, okay. And so uh, I assumed he'd call me back and go to men's retreat on my way back from men's retreat. And you got to catch the, the subtle things that God does here. It's just funny. He, um, he calls me, and so I have bad reception. And so I'm talking to Mr. Donahue on the phone, and I say, so, so what, what is it that you want me to be doing? And I hear... Oh, it's just crazy. Oh, you're concrete and sixty dollars an hour. Okay, I got concrete, I got easy, and I got sixty dollars an hour. I'm like, okay, well that's that's good. Like, how long would it take me to learn this? Is it is it just regular pouring concrete? Like what? Oh yeah, guys, concrete, and then it clears up. Oh yeah, I could teach you in five minutes. It's super easy. Okay, and then it would clear after that. It was totally. Clear. I was like, okay. He can teach me in five minutes. It can't be that hard. Pouring concrete. I had done that with my grandfather earlier, so I wasn't doing it for the first time, I thought. And so I came over. I thought, oh, fine. So I drive back to Fairbanks, and then he called me again. And he was out of town this time. He was driving back from um, the, the Air Force Base. Help me with this. Clear. Clear Air Force Base. So he was losing reception. And so I'm sitting there listening to him. And again, I say, okay, so... What exactly am I going to be doing? Because I want to be prepared. Pouring concrete. I need water boots. I need a certain kind of clothing. I need a certain kind of gloves. Am I going to be out in the weather? Am I going to be in a building? What do I want so I can bring what I need so I'm prepared when I'm ready to do this? And he's pretty much the same conversation. He's like, oh, yeah, it's super easy. I can teach you in five minutes. God's got concrete. Bring boots, okay? Okay? Okay. I can do that, you know? Okay. And so... Sunday night, done with church. I know, I know. I love your dad. He's a good guy. And so, and so, and he doesn't know this, by the way. So you can tell him something when you get home. Anyway, but, but so what happened is, I go back to the uh, to the house, and uh, after Sunday, Sunday's over. I leave Monday night, or I leave Sunday night. So I go home, get all packed, throw all the stuff in my car, and I'm driving down to Clear Air Force Base. Now, when you do something for the first time, it's not going to go smooth. I'm just telling you that now because. I'm just saying, it's the way life works. See that? It's the way my life works. So I'm driving down there. It is like, well, probably 11.30 at night. I get 20 minutes from Clear Air Force Base, hour and a half drive away. And, uh, and so when I get there, I call the guy that I'm supposed to be talking to. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And he's like, oh, I'm going to meet you at the gate. You got your ID? I'm like, oh, yeah, I got my ID. So I'm like fumbling around for it while I'm on the phone with them. And I'm like, Ooh. hold on, hold on. Do you have to have your ID? <laughs> He's like, yeah. I'm like, I don't have it. He's like, oh, that's not good. I'm like, yeah, I know. So I'm expecting him to say, ah, just forget it. He's like, all right, go home and get it. Meet me back here at 4.30. And I'm like, oh, no. So I go home, and I get like two hours of sleep, and I get up, and I get in the car, and I have my ID. And I drive down to Clear Force Base, get on the base, and so I'm going with this guy. He, I jump in his vehicle. Is this license? We get on the base. He's giving me a tour. He's giving me a tour. It's like like super dark. It's just starting to get light, and we're driving up to this big concrete mixing facility. I'm going, wow, that's bigger than the bags that my grandfather had. <laughs> and so as we get closer, I'm expecting him to be like, okay, we're going to be bringing the wheelbarrows in. I want you to be doing this and doing this and doing this. 
And so the closer we get, the more I start to get this sick feeling in my stomach that I'm doing something that I have no idea how to do. And so I, uh, I get closer and he gets out of the vehicle and, and there are four or five concrete trucks lined up next to each other. And so I get out and I'm thinking, okay, he's gonna, cause there's another guy with us, he's gonna give this guy a truck and he's gonna take me somewhere else. And so he starts giving us the rundown on a concrete truck, Brother Dave. And I was like, uh-oh, I know what this is. So I'm trying to figure out how I can tell him that I don't know how to drive a concrete truck. And so he's giving us a run through, and then it got worse. We get in the cab of the concrete truck, we open the door and climb up inside, and it's dusk, and it's like all wet inside of condensation. And then I see that thing that sticks up from the bottom of the floor that everybody, every teenager hates. It's a stick. And I'm like, uh, I can't wing it. And so, and so I said, you know what? I just came out and I said it. I said, you know what? You don't want to hear this right now. But I've never driven a truck that big in my life. And I'm not good at driving sticks. And so I think you should just take me back to the gate. And so that brings out a point. Don't try to be something you're not. Don't try to act like you know everything and there is nothing that anybody can teach you because the truth is they see that coming a mile away. They know you don't know what you're doing. And so they're probably not going to keep you around if it's a job. Okay, so be humble and just say, hey, I have no idea how to do this. And so the guy, to my shock and awe and horror at the same time, says, oh, well, he's a rough guy. Like, oh, well, let's just jump in the truck and go around once or twice. I'm like, oh, no, you don't want to do that with me. And so he gets in the truck. I'm sitting on this vehicle, and the seat's about this high, and the floor is down there. And I'm not a really tall guy, and it's what they call an air-riding seat. You'll know why that's important later. And so I get in this vehicle, and I'm holding the steering wheel, and I'm looking down. And I'm looking over here, and there's no seat next to me. So he's standing with me like this in the vehicle. And so I'm thinking, okay, so I know how a clutch works, and I know how the gears work. And so I pushed the clutch, and I revved the engine, and the uh, RPM gauge didn't move. That's the thing that tells you when you release the clutch and when you push the gas. And uh, I looked over at him, and he's like, oh, some of the gauges don't work. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So I rev it a little bit much to make sure I don't kill the concrete truck, you know, on the first time out. So I, I rev it up and I let go of the clutch and I go. <laughs> and so as I go, he goes. And then I let off the gas because that was too much. And then I go and then he goes. And then I push the gas because that's too much. That's too slow. And then I go and he goes. And then it's second gear now. So I hit the clutch and I change gears and then I go again and he goes. And so once we get going up the fourth gear, I don't want to go down. I got up here, I'm not going down. And so I'm getting out on this road and I'm driving along on this road and as I turn to go on the con, he's just showing me, okay, you're gonna go here. And he's saying words that I hate, four letter words I hate. You're gonna back there and you're gonna back up here and you gotta do this, you gotta turn here. And if you hit that, that costs a lot of money. And then you're gonna get out and you're gonna, and I'm just thinking, trying to keep the truck on the road. Why are you telling me this? And so we get over, we get back, and there's this bumping part. This is where the air ride your seat To this point, when I switch gears, I pull myself to the steering wheel and so that I can reach the bottom of the floor with the clutch. And then I reach over with the other hand while I'm steering and change gears and then let up on the clutch and bounce back onto the seat. When you go over bumps, in an air riding seat, you stay in the same place. But the vehicle moves around you. What that translates into is when your foot is on the gas pedal and you're going up and down, the gas pedal's going like that against your foot and the vehicle's going and this person, poor person, that didn't have a seatbelt in the passenger <laughs> is bouncing off the inside of the vehicle. And it's at this point in time when I just realized, you know, Brother Justin, some things in life are worth dying for. And so I pulled myself all the way to the steering wheel and I pushed the pedal all the way to the floor because I thought if we're going over the bumps, we're going over the bumps. And so we did. We did. And he kind of caught his balance and put his glasses back on and put his hat back on. And then I expected him to say, stop the truck. But he didn't. 
<laughs> he said, if you don't back up at that plant, you're going to pull into this plant. And I'm going, you don't get it, buddy. You don't want me driving this truck. And so long story short, he says, are you comfortable? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Is he dumb? <laughs> and so he said, I said, well, what, what if I go around again? I'm thinking if I do it twice to him, he might tell me just to get out and go home. And he's like, good idea, I'll get out. <laughs> so he gets out and sends me around again. And so the point of the story is, it's going to be over your head. You're going to have stuff that you're thrown into. Now, here's the thing. I drove that truck for 12 hours that day. And when I got used to it after four hours, I was very used to the truck now. I got used to the truck, and then I see this guy waving at me. He wasn't saying hi. So I pull over. My, the radio in my truck didn't work either. And so he, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go get in that truck. Okay. Now, all the trucks are not new, state-of-the-art, identical trucks. It's an old truck. So then he puts me in another truck. And the guy says to me, Okay, to start this truck, you got to push that button and you got to pull this and turn that. And I'm thinking, I don't know how to fly an airplane. I mean, it's not like a truck for an airplane. And so he, he goes through this process. I'm thinking, I can't let this truck die because I don't know how to start this thing again. And so I get in that truck and then he gets out and says, oh, and the speedometer doesn't work either. And none of the gauges work either. And so I'm like, oh. And he says, oh, and the concrete levers in the back, those are old school. And then he leaves. And I'm thinking... What is old school? And so don't expect it to get easier. When you're in something and you have no idea what you're doing, it's just going to get worse, okay? So you just do your best. Write that down. You do your best. Do you realize that in school, there was a man that touched on this at, at BBC a while ago, when you're in school, when you're going through life, you are not supposed to measure up to Brother Dave. That's right. You're not supposed to measure up to me. You are not supposed to be as smart or as good or as fast as any other person in your class. Right. Your job is to do your best. Mm, yeah. That's all God wants. You can't do, if you think about it, you can't do any better than your best. Right. So do your best. You may have no idea what you're doing. Be humble, be teachable, but do your best. There was a time when I went into... Uh, I was working with a guy, and he said, hey, I got a job for you. It's really easy. And now, I've learned since then to do investigating when they say that. But I believed him. I'm like, oh, yeah, easy job. I'll take it. Pays $20 an hour. This is before the concrete. I said, oh, yeah. Oh, $20 an hour is like government pay. Like, I'll take anything, okay? And so he says, okay. So, so he gets me set up, and he says, there's going to be a box, and you're going to go to Fred Myers. You're going to place all the phones inside of Fred Myers and the cords and the different things and the, the, the intercom system. Thinking, okay, that's fine, because all the jobs that I've been on with this guy, we work together and stuff. And so the night before, he just gives me a call and says, okay, you have the box because I picked it up from this place and that, and the big box and all kinds of miscellaneous cords in it and sheets and numbers and stuff. And so I looked it over, and he says, yeah, yeah, you got all that stuff? I'm like, oh, yeah, I got that stuff. He says, okay, so you're going to do the East Fred Myers first, then you're going to do the West Fred Myers. If you need any help, call me. <laughs> have you ever heard someone give you instructions and you kind of weren't listening because you thought you were going to do it with them. You know, your dad said, tells you to do something, you're, you're, someone tells you to do something, and you're glossing through the instructions while you're doing whatever you're doing because you think that you'll just go, oh, okay, and then you'll together go and you'll learn whatever he told you. That's kind of what I was doing. I don't do that. And so I panic because, I mean, I'm like, ah, uh, this isn't going to work. And so I'm like, uh, uh, I, I, I'm... I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be doing this on myself. And he's like, "Oh yeah, it's really easy." And I'm like, uh -huh. And so he's like an IT guy. He's been in the IT field for a long time. It's not Mr. Albert. Don't worry. And so, but the point is, I go to Fred Myers the next morning. And my mom told me something the night before while I was spazzing out. I was like, "Mom, this isn't gonna work." And she's like, "Stephen, the reason this happens to you." is because you radiate confidence. And I'm like, I hate that. I hate that. She's like, yes. when you look at someone and they just say, oh, that guy knows what he's doing. And I'm like, but I don't. And she's like, but they don't know that. And I'm like, you're not helping the situation. And so like all moms do, she's just like, it's going to be just fine. And I'm like, I hate to break the news to you, 
but do you realize that you're not coming with me? <laughs> and I have to do this. And so if it's not just fine, it's not your problem, so to speak. She's like, oh. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I end up going, and I end up fumbling my way through it. Okay? But part of the way was, I, I called the guy again. I said, okay, remind me, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with these phones? And so he gave me a quick overview, and I really paid attention to that quick overview. <laughs> but then after that, I just kind of went through it and figured it out. When you do something for the first time, you're going to have to figure stuff out. It's not just going to be handed to you. There was a sheet. You know, if I had to just replace the cords, I can plug and unplug cords. Then they give you a sheet that I didn't find until I got to the bottom of the box. And so I was like, oh, how many of those cords did I give out? How many of those phones did I give out? Where did I put that phone? And then I start checking them off, and then I have to go back and check them again and back and check them again. But the point is, you're going to have to figure stuff out. Okay? So what I would do, if I was going to be you, and I wanted to do things for the first time, is stop playing digital games. Yes, I know you can learn things, but get a puzzle. Get something that you can do with your hands and, and work on. Okay? Now, I'm going to lead into the next story, and then I'm going to be done. But... <clears throat> Brother Gil Anger, when he was up here, he talked about a boot camp. And he said, <clears throat> one of the things that he talked to me about was doing things for the first time. He says, you know, you, do, you, you live the same life and you're bored. He says, Americans are bored. He says, it's because they do the same thing over and over again and they get tired of it. So they keep doing it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> And so he says, now listen, you should be learning one new thing every day. He says, learn something with your hands every single day. And I was like, you mean I have to go learn something every day? Whoa, because I'm like, you know, your guys' days, I'm thinking, I ain't got time for that. And he's like, you know, learn how to tie a new knot, learn how to do a, do a new thing, make a new braid. Um, and, and, and figure stuff out that you'll use in the practical world. Go out and use a saw. Go out and build a dog kennel. Go out and build a birdhouse. Use things, and Brother Dave's going to have things this week that he's, he's going to be showing you guys. But the point is, go out and use your hands. And so he told me about this boot camp. And, and one of the reasons that I really got interested in going to this boot camp that I didn't think my parents would let me go to is because of the way he presented it to me. He said, you know, brother, I think you wouldn't like it. And I said, I wouldn't make what? Because at this point, he's, he's pushing Americans down just a little bit. And I, I, don't, I don't like that. And so I said, I wouldn't make what? He says, well, there's a boot camp over in India. And no American would make it. And I thought, okay, India? Yeah, probably not. But okay, that's fine. And he's like, but well, there's one in America that's almost just as bad. And I'm like, okay, I might be able to handle America. You know, India is far away. And so what ended up happening is over the next three months, I ended up signing up for a boot camp in misery. Missouri. And so I, I told, I told, I asked my parents and I asked my pastor. And I'm expecting them to say no. I go to my pastor. I tell them all about it. Oh, okay. I think, I think you should ask your parents. As long as that's okay with your parents, maybe. Oh, man. So I go to my parents and I present it in a, in a not so good way. Now, mom, there's going to be this hard boot camp and it's going to be rough. And uh, it's missionary training type stuff. And I kind of feel like. Like, maybe I should, maybe, maybe I should go there. And, uh, and what do you think? And she's like, I don't know. What does your dad think? I think it'd be okay. I think it'd be good for you. Oh, boy. And so I go to dad, and he says the same thing. So before you know it, I'm in the boot camp. And I find out that it's a survival boot camp. And I find out that the boot camp, they give you rice and beans. And they give you as little food as possible. And as little sleep as possible. And you are living out of your backpack, which if you sit down and walk away from it, they will take. And then you're living out of your shoes. <laughs> and so you guard your backpack with your life. But so what happens is in this boot camp, we're going through things. And the first week was pretty easy as far as, as far as, because it was more um, medical stuff, hands-on. So I had EMT experience. So I wasn't doing that for the first time. But then we got into this place where it just got hard. We went out in the middle of nowhere and we're living out of a... Um, tarp that was all torn up that we made a shelter out of. And sometimes in Alaska, I had had more outdoor experience than the other four city slickers. 
And so I said, guys, I don't know if we should build our cabin like this. Now you gotta listen to their logic, okay? These are city slickers from the lower 48. Oh, and they yeah. said, I said, now listen, there are, we're in a swamp. There are billions, literally, of mosquitoes out here. And they said, yeah, I know. I think that we should put the black on the outside so that it attracts the mosquitoes to the outside and they won't go inside the tent. And that's exactly the look I had on my face. I'm like, what? And so I said, what all good Alaskans to say, do you realize that inside the tent it's dark anyway? And they're like, well, yeah, but I mean, if we put the white side on the inside, then that would make it brighter. And I'm thinking, that doesn't work like that. No. And so not only did it draw more mosquitoes to our place of residence, but it also heated up like an oven in Missouri. And with the 98% humidity and all of the 100 degree weather that we had, it was absolutely miserable inside of that five man oven. And what's more is they said, look, if we do it this way, we can make it just wide enough to fit all of us in. And just tall enough, or just long enough to fit all of us in, and we'll build it this high. Oh, no. So you have no air circulation. And I'm like, are you guys Nazis? Like, who do you really work for? Are you guys making it harder on us on purpose? You know, and this is my team. This is my team that I work with. And so I said, you know what, guys? You build it however you want. Cause I'm gonna go get captured just so I can be away from you. Guys, okay? And so I didn't. But and so what happened is there was a night where we spent the night in that shelter. And it was the hottest night that I was there. And I'm in a 40 degree sleeping bag because I'm from Alaska. And so I brought a sleeping bag that I had, but it was a 40 degree, but it wasn't 40 degrees outside. It was maybe 140 in the bag. And so I'm in this sleeping bag, and, and it's, it literally sounds like there was a small airplane taking off because of how many mosquitoes there are outside of, outside of our heart. I have the bag over my head, and I am completely enclosed in this sleeping bag. Oh, no. And my mom had sewn a sheet on there that probably saved my life because I undid it, and I laid with the sheet on the ground. So that was at least a little bit of cool air. And so... The guys next to me start realizing that they're not going to go to sleep that night, which I knew. There's no way you're going to go to sleep. And so they decide that they're going to sing. And I'm like, okay. Except they're from a different place, so they're all from the same place. And so they all start singing songs I don't know. And so when I'm with these five people, I'm by myself because they're all doing something together. And I'm over here stuck in the corner, wedged beneath a really big guy in his really big sleeping bag that didn't help me at all. And so as I'm in the sleeping bag, you know that really humid feeling you get when you're in your sleeping bag trying to hide from mosquitoes? Yes. Okay. Well, imagine that times 100. Oh. I was so wet in my sleeping bag that it felt like I was in the shower. All of my clothes were drenched. And I literally had water, sweat, running off my face consistently. It was just running off of me. And I, could, I was just sweating to death. That's what I thought. And so I wanted really, 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 really bad. Because this was this was 10 o'clock at night that we went to bed. They're not getting us up until 6 or 5. And so at 10 o'clock, I decide, you know what? I'm going to be a tough guy and I'm going to endure this because I'm not going to be the one guy that quits. And so I suffer and I suffer and I breathe and I suffer and I kill the mosquitoes and I survive and I try to go to sleep and I try to think good thoughts. And then I think, okay, I've probably survived an hour now. And so I look at the clock and it's been 15 minutes. And I'm like, okay, I can't take another six hours of this. I just can't. And so I started thinking back to how I got in this mess. And I said, you know what? If I ever meet Gil Anger again, I'm going to talk to him. And then I thought, you know, it wasn't his fault. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Why didn't my pastor tell me this was a bad idea? Like, if God knew that I was going to be suffering this much, he should have told pastor that it was a bad idea. But pastor didn't say it was a bad idea. How about my parents? No, my parents didn't tell me it was a bad idea either. They told me I should come to this. And then... 
I started thinking, well, wait a minute. This is what I believe God wanted me to do. And since God uses your authorities to direct you, I got this really sick feeling in my stomach. And I thought, this is where God wants me to be. That's depressing. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, God, now I, I'd love for you to impart a spiritual truth to me right now that I would never get anywhere else. So I am ready. Because as soon as you learn the lesson, then the king says, come out of the fire. Okay. So I'm waiting for this like jaw-dropping angel to come next to me and be like, here, you endured, you can have this secret, and now you can go and, and be warm and, and, or, and be cool in an air-conditioned place. And so I'm sitting there. And nothing's happening. And I'm sitting there, and nothing's happening. And so I decide I'm going to sing a scripture song and cheer myself up. And so I exuberate more energy, which produces more body heat, and I sing more, which produces more moisture in my sleeping bag, and just makes me more miserable. And so I decide, you know what? I'm leaving. And so I thought I'm going to get up, and I'm, I'm not going to, like, get up. I'm going to get up. And I'm going to wreck this shelter. That way we don't have to get back in it. And I'm going to run out of my sleeping bag, and I don't care if they kidnap me or what. I am out of here. And I thought, you know, I can make it back to Alaska. I got 20 bucks in my wallet. I can bribe yeah. somebody. I can make it back to Alaska. We're just in Missouri. I have to hop, skip, and a jump away. I've survived for like a week and a half now. I can make it up the Alcan on like peanut butter that I'll steal from somewhere, I guess, and I can buy my 20 bucks. And so I'm like plotting this in my head. And I'm thinking, okay, what, when should I do this? These guys are sitting next to me. If I just jump up, then they're going to be after me. I need a good head start to get away from these guys. And so I start plotting this in my head. And then all of a sudden, it's like God says, so, and I'm like, so, are you going to help me? <laughs> And he's like, and the thought is, I mean, he's not talking to me, it's just thoughts coming to my mind. So you're going to leave? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to leave. <laughs> and he's like, but this is where I put you. And I'm like, I know, but aren't you going to help me leave now? And he's like, no, no. He's like, no. I said, so what is the point of me being here? Can you, can you just bring that thought to my mind? And nothing came. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, I'm trying to debate on whether I should leave or not. And the thought keeps coming back. This is where God puts you. Why are you going to leave? And I thought, because I'm miserable. And then God said, yeah, but I was miserable and I didn't leave. And I'm like, yeah, but it, I, it, it's, it's horrible. Like, I hate it. And he's like, yeah. I despised it, but I still endured it, and I did it for you. And the thought that God brought to my mind was very simple. He said, would you stay here for me? And I thought, well, you know, I'm not staying here for Joe Langer, that's for sure. And I'm not staying here for my parents. And I'm not staying here for pastor. And God says, but would you stay for me. And there was a song, and I only remembered one phrase of it, and it was, my grace is sufficient for thee. And God just kept playing that thought over and over again in my mind. And finally, I was like, I'll stay. But the only reason I'm staying is because you want me to. And you are the only thing that I'm going to do it for. And once I did that, I settled into my sleeping bag to survive another six hours of misery and off-tune singing from the bonehead <laughs> next to me. And I waited about ten more minutes. And in those ten minutes, it felt like, I don't know if this is me hallucinating, or if it was God just saying, because you denied yourself and you did what you didn't want to do, I'm going to give you a little bit of reprieve. But Brother Dave, it felt like there was a breeze that came through my sleeping bag. Now we have brush piled all the way around this. I don't know why. If you had lit a match, the whole thing would have burned up. <laughs> but somehow there was a breeze that came through my sleeping bag. 
and it was like God said, thank you. Do you realize that when you endure something that you don't want, that you didn't ask for, but that's where God put you. That's the family God puts you in. That's the people God puts you with. When you say, you know what, God? I'm going to stay. I'm going to do it for you. Do you realize God says, thank you? He does. And then 15 seconds later, after that breeze came through, there was this horrendous explosion and this bomb that went off next to our tent. Because the counselors and the people there were waking us up with a midnight attack, which I could not be happier for, because that meant I got to get out. And so that bomb exploded, and I mean, you felt it. Your ears were ringing, and you jump up out of your sleeping bag, and you grab your sleeping bag, and you grab your backpack, and you slept with your boots on because you didn't know when they were going to do something like this, and we took off through the jungle, but I didn't have to go back that sleeping bag. Now, I did not say I would stay in the sleeping bag because I expected God to get me out of it. I said that because I was expecting that I was going to have to stay in it. And a lot of times, you and I will get into scrapes and we'll think, okay, I'm going to say these words. Okay, God, I'm good with it. And then I expect God to get me out. But the question is, what if he doesn't get you out? But if you're going through something, what if you've gone through something and you didn't like it, you didn't want it, can you thank God for those things that you went through that hurt you? Did you know I'm very grateful for that experience that I had? Because I told my mom when I got back, I never felt closer to God than when I was in that sleeping bag. And I wouldn't have chosen that. But now I wouldn't, I wouldn't undo that for anything. Because when I was there, miserable, there was only one thing that I had. And that was God. When you go through life, when you do things for the first time, in all of your ways, acknowledge Him. God wants to be just as much a part of your life as your best friend. Or more. What you eat, what you wear, what you listen to, every part of your life. You might think that it's super small and he doesn't care, but he does. It says in all your ways, acknowledge him. God, what do you want me to do? And he'll direct your path. And he's going to give you all kinds of crazy stuff. But don't be afraid. Just step out by faith and say, you know what, God? You got me into this mess. So you're going to either get me out of it or you're going to get me through it. And he will over and over and over time. I have I have like 15 more stories that I could tell you. We're out of time. Don't quit. God's got you. Step out by faith and do something new. If you think your life is boring, try acknowledging God and doing something for the first time. Teaching a class, helping in class, doing chalk drawings, doing, hey, it doesn't have to be something big. He that is faithful and little, finish it, is faithful in life. So the day. Thank you, Stephen.